in the afternoon or evening or whatever the case might be. Do appreciate you guys joining us today for this 30 West IP webcast update. Today is November 2, 2022. So if you're viewing this later, then the information may have changed as always. Um, today, we're going to discuss a bit on oceanic updates. Before we get started, I'm going to take you through the basic controls again, as we do typically for these. Uh, but just to remind you how we're looking to, to handle the questions uh, and, and, and take the QA at the end of the session. So we're going to uh, focus on some of the controls real quick. Remember, the audio settings are completely up to you. We do have everyone muted because of the size of the group. Because of that, we're going to keep the microphones silenced on our end, and we'll ask that you guys send us questions through the Q&A panel. Try to refrain, or actually, I've actually disabled the chat, so you can't do that one. Uh, but as far as using the chat or the raise hand function, we'll ask that you try to refrain from using those because of the number of folks that we have out there versus just two of us here trying to catch all the questions as we go along. Instead, we would rather that you send the questions to us via the QA panel. When you send us those questions, we will take those in turn at the end of the session so that we can get these uh, questions on the recording for you uh, so that you guys can view this later on our YouTube channel and have all the questions to review there. As far as nonverbal reactions go, you're more than welcome to use those if you like. <clears throat> Excuse me, but as, uh, to get our attention with a question, please do use the question and answer panel for that. Now, if you're using an iPad, you have the same controls for that as well. And we do advise that you can use multiple devices if you like. You're more than welcome to use the iPad as well as the laptop, your choice. Now, before I hand it over to Mitch and have Mitch uh, take us through the Oceanic update for the day, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video so that you guys can have more space on your window. But just know that we'll be here to answer the questions, and we're going to take all the questions at the end of the session. All right. So with that, I will turn off my video and we'll let Mitch take us uh, through the update. Thank you. thank you, Joe, and thank you for everybody participating today. At least once a year, we try to do an oceanic update and, and look at what lies ahead for the coming year. And this year is no different, but this year we have a much more stable, much more easy to track future, and I think some things to be optimistic about. During the 40 year period between 1965 and 2005, the North Atlantic, as an example, didn't see a lot of changes. Um, there were very significant changes, but you can see that during the period between 1966 and 1977 and then 1997, there wasn't a lot going on. And during this period, we saw RVSM introduced, and that became a requirement. We saw fans introduced, but that wasn't a requirement. We saw slop introduced, and that was a requirement. So for over a period of 40 years, there just really wasn't a whole lot of change. During the period between 2013 and 2020, we saw massive change in the North Atlantic. There were not only new requirements, but there were new technologies. There were new waypoint naming systems. So this period saw a lot of webcasts being done by ATI and 30 West IP in an attempt to keep you, our clientele, abreast of what was going on. It was a period that we felt was tumultuous and perhaps a bit more accelerated than necessary. But in 2020, this slowed, and for a number of reasons, and that's what we're going to look at right now as we enter a period that's far more stable and easier to predict. An example in the North Atlantic is that in 2019, we saw three versions of the North Atlantic Operations Manual implemented as they went through rapid change. And in 2022, we saw the same version kept throughout the entire year. It has been a tradition that in January they would update this manual. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we think 2023 will show in the updates for that manual. But as we get to a period where change is more predictable, we don't think that we'll see two or three changes in the North Atlantic Operations Manual in a period of a year. The same pace of change is reflected in the North Atlantic 
operations bulletin checklist and you can see on the left in 2019 there were a number of different bulletins and we had to incorporate these of course into not just updates as we're doing now but into courseware and now in 2022 that list has been significantly reduced as this area has stabilized these changes have been incorporated into AIPs and the North Atlantic operations manual and largely these bulletins today represent things that you go back and you, you check your checklist against their recommendations. You look at what they're emphasizing for training and how the oceanic errors are laid out as opposed to, you know, entirely new programs that are being introduced. Now, we often use traffic counts to talk about how of changes are implemented in an oceanic airspace and the need to create change because of the increased traffic density and possibly reduced separation. In July of 2019, the North Atlantic saw a peak traffic count achieved. It was 2,000 flights a day that month and uh, that represented a peak. And of course, the uh, agencies anticipated that this would continue for quite some time. Now, as we all remember, COVID in March of 2020 changed everything. And here we see how it's reflected in the traffic in the North Atlantic. The traffic in the North Atlantic crawled to all record lows in decades as we saw the lockdown implemented around the world. In April of 2021, the recovery was in force and we began to see traffic pick up and a resumption of uh, more normal traffic flows as various countries allowed people to enter. And by September 2022, traffic had resumed to almost normal levels. We have not reached the peak that we saw in July of 2019, but we come very close to that. And consistently, we're seeing far more normal traffic flows across both the North Atlantic and the Pacific. The Pacific never suffered quite as much as the North Atlantic during COVID, but that period allowed them to take a pause on these changes. And of course, the changes were driven by increased traffic density and the need to reduce separation. And that density had been abated and the separation issues were no longer present. So it's quite understandable that between 2020 and 2022, what we saw was a consolidation of procedures and look ahead and a little better forecasting as to what we might see ahead as traffic's return to normal. The primary points that we want to discuss are the air data that was uh, released in 2021 from the North Atlantic, um, oceanic clearance procedures, ADSB mandates, the Anchorage PVCS implementation, and the Miami offshore. Uh, we won't spend a long time on any of them, but we always like to look every year when the air data comes out in the North Atlantic at what they're showing and it's largely because they have such an accurate method of managing their data through the NAT scrutiny group and it gives a very accurate picture. So let's begin there. Each year the North Atlantic Systems Planning Group will take the information from the scrutiny group and publish an annual safety report and in it we see a wealth of data that kind of helps us take stock of where we are in the industry and, and the things that we need to focus on. Are, uh, are key safety factors. This chart doesn't change a lot year to year. And in 2021, the top two areas that involved uh, oceanic airs both involved crew members. And those crew members were involved in clearance issues of a couple of different types. So let's kind of explore that. We're not going to go through all of these airs. We're just going to take a look at the top two. The top two are shown in red because these are errors committed by the crew and they center on topics that each of you will be familiar with if you've sat through our webcast before. Flight plan versus clearance. A crew flies a flight plan that was given to them, not the clearance that was issued, and other variations from the ATC clearance that lead to error. And those two are by and large the largest type of errors year after year. So we're going to look at those a little bit closer. Again here, they're shown as uh, number one and number two. So let's kind of dive in and take a look. Flight plan versus clearance. That's why we intend to fly a route, the route in a packet, a flight plan that we received, 
And in the course of doing so, we find out that that wasn't what we were cleared, that we failed to acknowledge a reclearance. And these occur in approximately 25% of the errors in the North Atlantic. Now, not all of these errors are manifest in gross navigational errors. Some of them are prevented by ATC, and we're going to talk about what that looks like because it can be just a little bit confusing. But I really do want to talk and reemphasize, when you receive a packet to cross the North Atlantic, that's plan. When you get a clearance, that's your commitment. The clearance is what we fly. And there's confusion about the clearance. They reissue you the same clearance that you often filed, and that can be confusing. And we're going to talk about that in the second segment after we look at these errors. The second is not adhering to ATC clearance. The failure to adhere to an ATC clearance is problematic at any point. This could be a vertical error a flight level, if you will, or a lateral error where you have a waypoint insertion or a, um, a speed error where you have a longitudinal deviation. Anytime you deviate from a clearance, it can compromise separation. And this is consistently, over decades, one of the leading concerns of the safety experts in oceanic regions. And in this year, it was 17% of the events that we saw in the North Atlantic. It's consistently either number one or number two, and these are the kinds of things that we focus on during our training and during our webcast. Now, while we talk about these errors, it's worth noting that not all of these 24%, not all of these 17% manifest themselves in an actual error. There was an error committed in the execution, but sometimes these can be prevented. There are ways that ATC can recognize that error and help you prevent that. If you're doing the proper procedures, sometimes it will help the controllers to be able to see and preemptively act to prevent the error. And these are recorded along with the actual errors because they're every bit as significant and they, they reveal to us some of the weaknesses within our system. Now, shown here, are the types of preventions that are commonly seen when we operate in the North Atlantic. Again, their data set is excellent, so we're going to use their data set. And we're going to talk about the leading two elements of that. First one is position reports. The use of position reports and the reporting of the next and the next plus one position helps to reduce errors by 34%. That's a huge number. That's where those interventions prevent an actual error from occurring. And when that occurs and that intervention occurs and ATC reaches out to us as crew members, it can often be confusing as to what it is that they're trying to tell us. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore that for a little bit so that if we were in an instance where ATC were to notify us, we would have a better understanding of what it is that they're seeing and how we can assist them to mitigate that error. As always, we're going to take a plotting chart and a MCDU and a computerized flight plan, and we're going to try to make this uh, relate to how we would see it in the cockpit. And if you'll allow me, down in the lower left-hand corner on the route, there's an airplane. I've circled that airplane in yellow. And the reason I've used yellow is yellow is the color on the MCDU line of the air position that that aircraft is crossing, that would be 49 North 050 West. Now, when I cross a point, I'm going to send a position report either via HF radio or a fan system with an ADSC contract would send an event contract with a position report, and it would be the same information. And basically, as we see on the right, I'm telling them where I'm at at 49 North 050 West. The time that I'm at that location and the flight level. Now, let's kind of deconstruct a position report. Obviously, if I'm at 49 North 050 West and I was supposed to be at 50 North 050 West, that's a problem. That doesn't occur a lot. We don't see operators arriving at the wrong point 
um, it often is anticipated and intervened with. So in this case, I'm at the correct point. I'm on my route of flight. The time is important because that's how they establish longitudinal separation. If I'm early, I may be too close to an airplane in front of me, or if I'm late, I may be too close to an airplane behind me. And of course, the flight level is very important. So I'm establishing this is my current position. And I may have passed that position when I send that position report. I may have passed that position three or four minutes ago, maybe five minutes ago. But that's where, when and where I was at the time that I crossed that required reporting point. Now next, as you see in the magenta line, would be the point in which we're in route two. This is my next point. And that was part of the phrase that we saw in that, that um, airline, next and next plus one. And I put it in magenta because that's how it appears on my MCDU. And this would be 51 North 040 West. And in my position report, what I'm doing is I'm informing ATC of when I will arrive at that point. I'm estimating 51 North 040 West at 0213. The time again is important for longitudinal separation so that they can ensure that I'm not getting too close to an airplane in front of me or an aircraft behind me. And the location is extremely important because if I were to give this position report three or four minutes after crossing the waypoint or it were sent by fans immediately and this point were an error, an immediate action by ATC might help us to correct that and avoid a gross navigational error. They might be able to inform us we're going to the wrong waypoint and get us back on track. We don't see that happening a lot because of what we'll see in the very next step. But this is, again, exploring and deconstructing the position report. The final piece of the position report, which is every bit as important as everything else, would be the next plus one. And as shown in a green circle in the center of the plotting chart is the subsequent waypoint, the one after the one I'm en route to, the ne not the next one, but the next plus one, and that would be 53 north 030 west. It's in green because that's how it would appear on my MCDU. And if we look at the position report, I'm simply informing them, yeah, after this leg, on my next leg, I'm going to go to that point. Here is where interventions can take place and if that waypoint were incorrect and it were an error, a waypoint insertion error, we could correct it before we ever entered that leg. And that's gone on since the advent of a position report, where I would give a position report, and if, I, if the next plus one were wrong, they would come back and query me, um, can you confirm the waypoint after 51 North 040 West? I confirm it, and if it's wrong, they can correct it. So interventions took place long before FANS, but FANS makes them even more effective than they were at the time. And the next plus one waypoint will be illustrated in an error so we can kind of get a visual representation of how that looks. Now let's imagine that we have placed one of the waypoints in an error, and in this instance, it would be the next plus one waypoint. So the next plus one waypoint is 52 North 030 West. Our actual flight plan, our clearance was 53 North 030 West. So the error shows a full one degree incorrect waypoint on the next plus one. Now, when this occurs, if I give that position report and I report 52 North 030 West as the next waypoint, either via HF or through an event report, ATC would recognize that that's not what was on our clearance, the black line, and they would inform us that, in fact, we had that error. And in that instance, they would be intervening, and they would be preventing an error because the red leg that you see here is not a leg we're on. That's the next and the next plus one leg. So that's how an intervention works. And if they call us and they ask us to verify a waypoint after our next waypoint, and there's some confusion, they may ask to get it in the 13 character version, the full lat long, so that they can avoid any ambiguity about that waypoint. And you should be ready to re-examine your clearance so that you can ensure that you're doing the correct thing. Now we always like to put a positive spin on things and what's the best way to prevent a waypoint error? 
And each of us has a tool at our disposal that's invaluable in helping us prevent this, and that is our SOPs. Well-written and well-executed SOPs will help us to avoid these types of situations. Now on the left you see an MCDU and on the right you see a computerized flight plan. And most SOPs are designed consistent with the recommendations of the state of registry to have us look at the lat longs and confirm each of the waypoint lat longs, but then in addition to check the mag course and distance between each of those waypoints. And those should be within approximately two degrees, maybe three or four, and two nautical miles. So here you'd see between 51 North 040 West and 53 North 030 West, the MCDU matching the flight plan would show that the MCDU is within two degrees and two nautical miles. That would confirm that that leg is correct. So this is what we want to see and we want to validate that during our SOPs. Now we see in this instance that there is an error in the MCDU. A waypoint insertion error has uh, resulted and we have 52 north 030 west shown as a subsequent waypoint. And as a result, when we look at the mat course and distance between that leg and error, it's 091 for 379 and it doesn't match the flight plan. It doesn't match the clearance. And if that is the case, then what we want to do is we want to scrutinize that position and try to ensure that we can identify where the error is. And this is where the full value of proper SOP checks comes into play. As we look at that in the MCDU and then we validate it against the flight plan, which is consistent with our clearance, we can see that the next waypoint is in fact an error and it will allow us to correct that. So we always want to focus on how we can avoid those errors by using good SOPs. Now the next intervention method is the use of the CPDLC message confirm assigned root. And confirm assigned root is even more powerful as an intervention tool and has led to over 41% of the successful interventions of an error. And all of us that operate in the North Atlantic are familiar with confirm assigned root. But let's take a moment and look at how they will respond if in fact the route that we send isn't the correct route. Returning to the North Atlantic chart with the same route and an MCDU with a confirm assigned route message, we would be asked to respond to that message by reporting our route or confirming our route. And it would be confirm in most columns and con report in most Honeywells. There are variations. And so we would select and that would send them the route that the FMS or the FMC has in it for the route of flight. Now we prefer instead of confirm assigned route, you're confirming your cleared route. That's a better term. Uh, so I'll just add that because really it's all about the clearance and I think that helps us to identify that. And in this particular instance, the solid black line would reflect the clearance and that's the route that would be sent to ATC. Now, the magenta overlay of that solid line shows that the NAV system matches the cleared route. So when it sent that route to ATC, it matched and they don't respond. Now, I think that's a little negligent in the design of the system. Any kind of communication should be closed out. If we confirm the assigned route, then they should respond with assigned route correct. They don't do that. But if it is in error, they do send us a message, and that's kind of what we want to explore here today. In the event that we have a waypoint error, and in this instance, I'm going back to the 52 North 030 West error that we illustrated earlier, um, then I would be sending them a route with a waypoint insertion error, and that red route with the error in it wouldn't match my cleared route. And ATC would identify that. And, and since that's my next plus one, as we saw in the position report, they can inform me of the error and I can correct it before I enter that leg. So this is much like the position report in that it's a predictive tool that looks at our flight plan and allows us to identify misidentified waypoints, misinserted waypoints, and to be able to correct it. 
The response from ATC has in the past sometimes been confusing to the crew. So what we want to show here is page one of two and page two of two in a representative message set that you could receive if in fact you had a waypoint in the air. They would send you a message telling you that your position report indicates incorrect routing. Check full degrees and minutes, meaning the 13 character lat long located loaded into the FMC, FMS in our version. And then they would give you the route that was your clearance and you were to take this route and determine which point is in error and the expectation is that you will correct it. It's important to note that history has shown that when they send that message with the expectation that you will correct it that they will subsequently send another confirm assigned route and that you would need to then report or confirm that route so that they could see that the correction had taken place. I, I always like to mention the follow-up action because we have seen instances in the past where a business aviation crew didn't make the correction and then they didn't respond to the confirm assigned route the second time and ATC had to reach out to them on HF radio and they had a rather protracted conversation because the crew didn't really appreciate what was going on. So our efforts here today are to allow you a peek inside what the ATC folks are seeing and doing so that when you enter a dialogue with them that you're able to support their um, efforts to eliminate that error before you enter that leg. Now we've talked about confirm assigned route. We've talked about flying the flight plan instead of the clearance. Those are both centered around the importance of your oceanic clearance and you're receiving that oceanic clearance update prior to entering oceanic airspace and there are changes afoot to change that procedure that we think will be significant and will help. And, and last year we mentioned this in our November update. And we anticipated this would have been completed during the subsequent year, but it wasn't. And we want to go back and touch on it because we do expect this change to be implemented in the coming year or 18 months. This would be a change to the North Atlantic. The North Atlantic is the only um, region that uses airborne oceanic clearances routinely. Uh, the information we're going to show you is out of the um, meeting of the North Atlantic Systems Planning Group that took place in June of 2022. They publish this every year so that people like us can, in fact, track what is going on and uh, identify where we can improve our operations. In the minutes, they identify that they have a project team working to um, build the case for the removal of oceanic clearances, airborne oceanic clearances in the North Atlantic. And the North Atlantic Systems Planning Group was advised that this was a little behind schedule and that they had to push the target date for implementation. So we mentioned this last year and we do expect that it will here transpire here very soon. They have a, a group working on um, implementing a concept of operations. It's a very orderly and uh, systematic way of creating this change that will help um, make it as transparent and as successful as possible. So we do hope to see this, but let's, let's kind of look at what they're doing as we did last year so that we can anticipate what it might look like. During a typical day in the North Atlantic, approximately 98% of the flights do not require a reclearance. The way it is currently managed, all 98% are still going through a oceanic clearance procedure, even though it is the clearance that they got on the ground. This is an opportunity to create confusion and to uh, ferment doubt within the mind of the crew. This could be avoided. We could just say, okay, I, I'm not going to give you an airborne clearance if it is what you got on the ground. That would eliminate confusion. But there continues and will continue to be an, an element of flights that will get reclearances. It could be 2%, 3%, 4% varies in traffic, but they would continue to get a reclearance even in this new system. But in this new system, if I didn't get an airborne clearance and then somebody went to the trouble of calling me and telling me I needed a new clearance, I would recognize this is unique and requires special action 
and it will allow me to separate the abnormal reclearance from a normal clearance. Like New York and their procedure, you would get your root portion on the ground. Now, we're looking at this and we're speculating at this point, but what we would anticipate is that they would probably continue to require you, like New York does, to verify your flight level and your Mach number. That may not be true, but that seems to be um, a fairly easy mitigation for vertical air and longitudinal air, and they're already using it in New York. So that wouldn't be difficult. For those of you who are familiar with how New York does it, you get your root clearance on the ground, and they simply verify your flight level and Mach number. Ideally, we'd be able to use technology to eliminate this as a problem, and they could push to load you a flight plan, and you could enter that route right into your system. A type of that technology exists currently, but some of the ground centers can't support that across FIR lines, so that isn't in the near future, but down the road could, in fact, help improve that. Enough about clearances. Now let's look at where we are at the implementation of space-based ADSB. This is a topic we talk about continually. It fascinates us, and it's full of surprises. Space-based ADSB has enormous potential to mitigate air in oceanic airspace. Surveillance, real-time surveillance in oceanic airspace, obviously would be a huge contribution to safety. This technology is being looked at around the world in oceanic airspaces, but the North Atlantic was the first to use it, and they have a very robust system that they have proven as a concept in their airspace. And as a result, at their most recent systems planning group, they have initiated a change. The North Atlantic Systems Planning Group is proposing that ADSB be mandated for their airspace after 1 January 2026. This would allow them to get the maximum advantage for space-based ADSB in the North Atlantic. They're using it with very successful results. It's improved safety and it will continue to be pursued by other oceanic regions as well. Now this shouldn't be a very big deal for North American operators because we're already required to have ADSB. Last year we mentioned space-based ADSB in the FAA's oceanic airspace and during the course of 2022 a presentation by the FAA talked about the progress that they're making and we'll explore it just a little bit here. Recall if you will that this is a system where a series of low earth orbit satellites, uh, iridium satellites, have ADSB receivers on them and that aircraft operating anywhere in the world can be monitored by that system. And the idea was that this system would give worldwide surveillance for aircraft that were equipped with 1090 ES ADSB systems around the world. There were some surprises and that's what the FAA has discussed in this presentation. First, it's limited to 1090 ES. Now that is the required system for jet aircraft operating at high altitude. It's a required system in many of the countries that require ADSB, but the U.S. allows for a system called the UAT system, and that system is not supported by ADSB, space-based ADSB. And then an additional problem is that some of the aircraft have bottom-mounted antenna placement, and they don't have an antenna on the top. Now, that's a result of the U.S. having a transponder system, a MODES transponder, that doesn't have a requirement for two antennas, often referred to as um, antenna diversity. The reason that it works in the North Atlantic and that they're having problems with it in the Caribbean and in the Pacific is that the Europeans require an enhanced MODES transponder, uh, a MODES transponder that has additional capabilities. And one of them is that the European transponders have to have an antenna on the top and the bottom. They mandate antenna diversity, and that's the same antenna used by the ADSB. So aircraft that are crossing the North Atlantic going to Europe would have that antenna on the top. And that's why it works so well in the North Atlantic, so successfully, but yet is plagued with... Um, 
reliability issues in other oceanic regions. As a result of the surprises, the implementation date that might be utilized for FAA oceanic airspace has been pushed out for somewhere in the three to five year timeline as they try to come to grips with how they are going to manage that implementation and the differences associated with the type of transponder requirements we have. Now in that presentation, we were seeing the FAA talk about uh, Pacific and Caribbean operations. Let's move to the Anchorage flight information region and talk about the PBCS system that is currently in use there. Last year, we talked about how Anchorage had, via NOTAM, implemented PBCS requirements at certain altitudes on Romeo 220 and the NOPAC. The NOTAM, which was issued on 2 December 2021, was effective through 1 December 2022. So let's take a look at the NOTAM. Aircraft which are routed through the Anchorage NOPAC route structure on Romeo 220 should have, and then they go through the PBCS requirements, RCP 240, RSP 180, and RMP 4 equipage in order to operate on flight level 340 through flight level 400 inclusive. So this implements a PBCS requirement for any aircraft on Romeo 220 on those flight levels as the beginning of a transition to PBCS across a much broader region in the Pacific. Now this has certain dates associated with it, as I mentioned. The dates associated with this started last year prior to our webcast on oceanic updates. And, and of course this year our oceanic update is again in November because this NOTAM will no longer be in effect. So as we read through the minutes of the meetings that the FAA has had regarding this, We'll take a look at what the future holds. For that period between December 2021 and December 2022, Romeo 220 has, as shown her in purple, PBCS requirements for that block of airspace. On to December 2022, phase two was anticipated and would add an airway, might. 523, we talked about this last year, and would expand PBCS to Romeo 580 as well and create true reduced separation of the NOPAC for additional efficiencies. Now, this will not be done on 2 December 2022, and they'll reissue that NOTAM and they'll provide us the guidance that will take us through this, but this has been delayed and we're not entirely sure for how long. But you can count on the fact that when it does change, we will do a webcast and we will. Um, get you up to date on when and how this implementation will occur. But like so many things, this too is delayed. And finally, we did see in the original concept that this would expand across the NOPAC, and we do eventually expect that to occur, but that will be some years down the road. And again, we'll have a webcast update when that does occur. Our final subject is Miami Offshore, and this is actually what we believe is oceanic airspace, but uh, it is managed through an ATC system that is more akin to the domestic airspace. And so let's take a look at what's going on in the Miami Offshore. We followed throughout the years the implementation of U.S. domestic en route CPDLC. This is an expansion of the digital clearance system where you would use KUSA to communicate through CPDLC with the FAA Airborne and it was implemented originally in Kansas City and Indianapolis. It has expanded. It was uh, a bit slower of an implementation because of COVID and the ability to train controllers and bring it online. But the most recent change, as you see here, includes Miami Center in the Miami offshore area. And this is Technically, oceanic airspace, because in some of the airspace, you're outside of VHF and outside of uh, VOR reception, but it's managed by a domestic ATC system, a uh, system called ERAM, and, and the oceanic sectors are managed by an oceanic system that is a bit different. And so this airspace is part of the DCL system, and it's part of FANS 1A, but it's being managed in the same way that we see Kansas City, Indianapolis, Washington, and Oakland, Minneapolis, and that type of thing. It's not being treated as oceanic fans 1A. So we just wanted to highlight that because, in fact, it is 
an oceanic sector, but it's being managed as a domestic sector. This domestic system does require certain equipage, and that equipage is VDL mode 2, and it has to be a certain type of VDL mode 2. It would be identified on your op spec or your letter of authorization, an Alpha 056, and in addition to participate, you'd need to be part of a trial program. Again, returning to a NOTAM, the NOTAM talks about how general aviation and business aircraft are prohibited from using the FAA en route CPDLC system unless they're approved as trial participants. And this isn't a particular onerous process if you'd like to participate. Many of our clients do. But you need to have a system that is prepared and compatible so there is a process to go through. That concludes our update. And now I'll return to Joe and we'll take questions. Awesome. Thanks, Mitch. <clears throat> Excuse me. My apologies there. <clears throat> I guess I should have kept my throat warmed up while you're doing all the talking. <laughs> well, we don't appear to have um, any active open questions. Not Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's kind of surprising, to be honest. Um, yeah. We did have one. I'll, I'll go ahead and revisit that. Uh, I think folks might have seen it, but I just want to get on the recording. Uh, Joel asked, uh, with our fans' capability, is it no longer important to announce on HF radio that our estimated time at next waypoint changes by three minutes or more? Yeah, you already I wrote an answer, so I'll let you go ahead and verbalize it. When you have an established ADSC contract, you do not need to update time differences of uh, more than two minutes. Now, um, I said, yeah, that's correct. I, I kind of gave a simplistic response and then realized after I sent it, um, when we talk about being on fans, you know, you're talking about having both CPDLC and ADSC. So if you, ha you have to have an active ADSC contract for that to be the case. But yes, Joel, that is correct. And I, I also want to add, when I talked about Miami and that offshore sector and how it's domestic CPDLC, um, they're not using ADSC domestically currently. So it's, it's CPDLC for communication only in that Miami sector. It's another way to differentiate whether, you know, you're using fans, you have several capabilities, you have the CPDLC, and then you also have ADSC. And I'll add to it, it to, as, uh, you mentioned his question was three minutes. And as you mentioned, two minutes, the two minutes addressed uh, is, is for the Nat region. And it's three minutes for all the other oceanic regions. So you, you're good to go there. And Joel responded with uh, software coming up for the 650 to be able to do the domestic system. That's excellent. Good to hear. Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and click answered live on that one. Thanks, Joel. Appreciate that follow up. Now, I don't see it written here. And I'm assuming this is David. Uh, David, you have your hand up, but you, I, I don't see the first letter in your name, but I know your last name. So, uh, David, if you have the question, uh, I suppose, Mitch, do you want to open the microphone for David? Should I doubt, do that or have, have him just type it in? Have him type it in if you would. All right. Cool. Yeah, David, if you will, just type in your question. I see your hand is raised. If you'll just type in your question <clears throat> in the Q&A or your comment, we'd appreciate it. All right. Uh, Josh asking, have you heard anything through the grapevine regarding domestic CPDLC approvals for various GA manufacturers? In their case, it's Gulfstream, uh, but they have not heard of many corporate operators being able to get approval. I'd so, yeah, I'm not ahead. sure about Gulfstream. I think Joel answered that Block 3 and the 650 would allow that, but I, Joe, don't we have, I mean, we talk to clients every week and mm -hmm. don't we have a pretty good number of clients with business aviation aircraft that are doing it uh, i would say the majority yeah yeah uh, um, because we pull that you know routinely um informally so yeah. i would suggest that it, it is a, well, it, perhaps more use than i would have expected when i do say the majority i'll say those that have uh the desire to do it <laughs> i'll put it that yeah. way but yeah most folks that wanted to get domestic were able to do it all right, David, I'm going to I'm going to get to David's response real quick here. I'm going to click answered live on that one. 
uh, David is saying, Joe, if possible, would like to verbalize a couple of items with using crew master flight plan. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah, go ahead and open this mic, Joe. All right, let me find you real quick. David, I'm going to lower the hand real quick. Oh, no, nope, that was a mistake. David went away. There it is. Okay. Promote to panelists, remove chat. All right. Um, Mitch, you might have to be able, you might be the one that has to select him to allow him to. Nope. There okay. we go. I've got it. I've got it. All right. David, I've David, got you your be microphone able to unmute open. And go you ahead should... and um, help us out. Radio check. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Hey, uh, hello, everybody. And uh, Mitch and Joe, fine job as always. Thank you for these uh, invaluable sessions. <laughs> Just a couple items on the uh, for your audience for the crew master flight plan. And uh, Mitch hit on some of these already. When you're looking <clears throat> at your uh, MAG course and distance check, as, as Mitch said, the industry standard is plus or minus two degrees or two nautical miles. Some of you may seen, have seen cases where it was three degrees on the MAC course or more, three or four degrees. And you might be wondering if you have a programming error, not necessarily. <clears throat> You've probably heard that there's two things that can contribute to that. One is the magnetic variation tables might've caused the difference. The second is there's a difference between the way the MAC course is computed for the uh, the master flight plan versus the FMS. I think Mitch has probably gone over this in the past, but just to reinforce it, um, the FMS, as you know, is a running DR. So it'll give you an outbound mag course, which it adjusts as the aircraft moves along. The crew master flight plan gives you an average or a midpoint mag course. <clears throat> so the way these mag courses are computed uh, versus the FMS and the crew master flight plan and the magnetic variation tables can lead to more than a two degree difference in the mag course. So just keep that in mind. And on the uh, reclearance that Mitch went over, uh, as he said, it's the number one scenario lead to a gross nav error, a G&E. Um, and we find that uh, uh, most of these errors are very basic errors. It's not, it's not a complex error, it's just a basic cross check maybe that was done or maybe the crew got busy with another task they were doing. Uh, maybe one crew member was off the flight deck, whatever it is. Uh, but uh, we, we don't always find when we're flying with operators uh, or, or doing surveillance or looking at their applications for uh, oceanic operations that they have a process to recompute the magnetic course and distance if they get a reclearance. And they'll say, well, you know, I got the reclearance. I programmed the box. <clears throat> okay, what is your independent, uh, independent source to, to cross-check the FMS? Because the master flight plan is no longer current. So very important that you have an independent process to check what the FMS is generating for mag course and distance, such as 10 degree longitude tables. Uh, some aircraft can have a new flight plan sent to them, whatever your process is. But we have a lot of operators out there that, Say, well, I'll just reprogram the box and, and see if it looks okay. That, that is not a confirmation of the FMS. You need a confirmation since the uh, crew flight plan is no longer accurate. Over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, and, Absolutely. you know, that would be a good uh, add-on to a webcast because we do an extensive look at all those topics during the initial and uh, if there's interest, and maybe if you could raise your hand, if you have any interest in seeing that, we could do like a 15-minute segment on one of the webcasts about how all that would look. We have a really nice way of uh, graphically displaying it and uh, detailing exactly that, because Dave, you're, you're spot on. Ob obviously, this is your business, and um, we... <laughs> Okay, so we're getting enough of we're a getting response. a boatload of thumbs ups and hand raises, and okay. I think I think it sounds like folks want to see this hearts. Okay. <laughs> that's awesome. Excellent. Then that that's something that uh, we we can and bring in. Um, we're we're always looking for different different ideas. Th and thank you, Dave. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You bet. Appreciate you pitching in on that one, man. That, hmm. I I didn't want to throw you under the bus, so thanks. <laughs> Glad to do it. Thank you very much. All right, I will lower the hands and then uh, we'll, we'll go with the rest of the QA questions. And if you guys do have more questions, please put them in the QA. So we'll start at the top here with Jason. Uh, Jason's asking, is it still necessary to state CPDLC 
when checking in with a new controller? That would be regionally dependent, but yeah. if you're in the North Atlantic or if you're in the FAA's airspace in Oakland or in Anchorage, it is not required according to the AIP. However, some this is, we always caveat this when we talk in mm -hmm. training. Controllers are just like pilots, and there is a stated method of performing that, and the world's not perfect. So we do get feedback. Well, I didn't tell them CPDLC, and they asked if I was CPDLC. So um, the correct answer is, in most of the regions we fly, you do not need to state it. As is illustrated, Doc 007 gives you an example, as is illustrated in the AIP. But you can find controllers who, like me, are old and didn't change and <laughs> might want to ask something that uh, is a holdover from another period. Very good. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me, Thomas is asking, have you heard any information uh, for when the domestic CPDLC will transition out of the trial phase and open up to greater fleets of aircraft by default? I don't know. Dave might know. Um, that is something that I, I'm not sure they know exactly what the future looks like because of the limitations of the ground technology. And, and that was surprising to them when they implemented it. When they implemented the US CPDLC system, um, they were under the impression that it would work with just about all the equipment and it doesn't. So I think there's a lot of adjustments being made. And uh, I don't, I, I, although we have read the minutes of some of the meetings, it isn't clear exactly how they intend to respond to that. So I apologize, I can't answer that better. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, Kim is asking, what do you see are the future for ADSB being active worldwide? Uh, follow up, do you think plotting will someday no longer be required? So uh, what do you see as far as the future for ADSB being active worldwide? Well, I think it's um, going to dominate, um, but it's going to take time and investment because either a country is going to have to pay um, something like uh, uh, Arion to provide provide that, or they're going to have to build the system. And there will always be holdouts who perhaps may not want to invest the money, but it will predominate. Uh, plotting will continue to be part of what we do until they have uh, direct controller pilot communication. We talked about that a couple of webcasts ago. Um, direct controller pilot communication uh, the best example of that would be VHF. That's uh, currently what we see. If they had in the North Atlantic, let's say, the ability to put uh, VHF satellites out there, and then you had VHF coverage in the North Atlantic, and you had ADSB coverage in the North Atlantic, there might be a future where that's not necessary. And I'm, I'm, obviously, I think there would be a future, but I'm not sure how quickly we would fold in on that. Um, in a previous webcast, we talked about how uh, there are some regions, uh, Singapore comes to mind, where they're using low earth orbit satellites for remote um, VHF communication over the water. Uh, and we do expect to see that technology continue to develop, uh, but it's going to be uh, slow. Mm -hmm. As as most things tend to go. <laughs> Martin, thank you very much. Martin says, uh, thanks. Good show. We do appreciate that. Uh, and Always good to hear from your you, input. Absolutely. Good to hear from you. Awesome. Joel uh, saying the G600 is equipped for domestic CPDLC now. Okay. Thanks, Joel. And that kind of goes, I'm going to go jump down a little bit to Steve. Good morning, Steve. Thanks for joining us or afternoon, probably where you are. Steve says for Gulfstream per their website, only the G280, G500 and G600 are currently eligible to participate in US Datacom trial. And then he says, uh, uh, sorry for the en route services as he's saying. So yeah, he's specifying as, as we do during our training as well for the domestic use of CPDLC, this trial for business is for the en route use of it. You guys are all still very welcome to use your CPDLC for clearances on the ground using KUSA. What we're talking about for the trial is only for the en route portion in those sectors, those centers that we saw in green on the L3 map. <clears throat> Excuse me, my apologies. Thank you very much for that input, Steve. Awesome. Liam asking, when using SLOP with a Honeywell system, we routine, routine, uh, routinely get a follow-up confirm assigned route after submitting. Is this common? 
I'm not entirely sure I'm getting my head around that. Um, uh, in the North Atlantic, you'll get a confirm assigned, you should get a confirm assigned route for all of the centers, except potentially New York. Right. Um, and, and, and it is unrelated to slop. Now, I think perhaps what you're suggesting is you get a second one and, um, I don't know if that's common and it would be perhaps, uh, ah. something somebody within the group can answer. Ed popped up an answer and that makes sense to me. Ed says, it's just a coincidence. It happens simply to be a coincidence because about the same time you start using slop is when they automatically send out that confirm assigned route. And Liam's come up back with occasionally we're forced to confirm via voice. We reverted to exiting slop send route and then. Oh, I don't. Uh, I I understand what you're saying now, Liam. You believe that the slop is causing the problem, and um, it has not been the ins the case for many of our clients. We have not seen other clients state that they are routinely able to use slop and confirm assigned route isn't screwing it up. Um, but I can't ensure that that's not the case in your airplane. And Josh replied to Liam as well, saying it might be a matter of timing, question mark. Confirm a sign route comes up about five minutes after your first fix. So it, that could be potentially a timing. All right. Uh, Tony is say, asking or making comments. Uh, Challenger 605 has been approved for on trial, uh, on trial, on tail specific. And Challenger 604 Fusion will not be approved for domestic fans. All right, Tony, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, we're going to go ahead and answer. Uh, I'm going to close Liam's out as well. Eric, is LOA required for Oceanic Ops for Part 91 operations now? <clears throat> I think we, yeah, the answer basically is yes, according to our, yeah. Dave, could, Dave might, uh, again, want to comment on this. But our view is that if you're operating out of the ocean, you need to have a long range um, navigation LOA. And mm -hmm. obviously, if you're operating RVSM. above 285, you're going to want to have an RV, you're going to need to have an RVSM LOA. Um, and we did a whole webcast on that uh, about six months ago. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the reason we did the webcast is we get this question a lot, and it's, it's not a simple answer. Uh, if, if, if you want a simple answer, it's yes, you do. Um, if you want to break out all the nuances of where you do, that's what we do in the webcast. We say, well, if you're going to Canada, this is what you need. If you're going to Bermuda, this is some other things you need. And then if you want to go to North Atlantic, these are some things you need. So that webcast really devotes about 30 minutes to addressing that in, in its entirety. And, and that'll be on our YouTube channel there, Eric, uh, and, and it's uh, LOAs, why and where. That was the, the title of that one. Excellent. Good question. Mike uh, said like, uh, so he would like that, that update the. Uh, uh, and we'll do that. Uh, I, I enjoy, in fact, Joe, Joe, I'll tell you, I love teaching plotting and ETPs and that's the, yep. the thing that I've taught for the longest. And, and uh, so we'll, we'll do that. Val. Excellent. Good. Good to hear from you. Val's asking, does the, the master document qualify as a journey log as required by SAFA? and others or do we need to have an additional form good question mel and uh most master documents not i can't speak with the entirety of the, all the different versions of computerized flight plans which is what we refer to as a master document do not have the entirety of the information most organizations do not create a single source document for a journey log the uh, requirements for a journey log are in AC9170 Bravo, they're in 8900.1, they're in ICAO NX2. And generally what most of us do in the flight department I was in is uh, between a general deck, uh, a trip sheet, which contained information in, that was important, and the maintenance mm -hmm. log, which was signed by the PIC. One of the things that has to happen is the PIC has to sign a document about the flight. Uh, and then the computerized flight plan, you have all the elements there. Uh, so many organizations don't choose to create a single document, but yet have all that information available through um, a variety of the documents that they retain. Excellent. Thank you. Jeff is asking, uh, can't flight plan providers use initial mag course in flight plans at customer request 
Yes, Jeff, they do. And we've seen that. And we, we, when we do the initial course and when we do that talk, we show both formats. We show how mid-course is uh, presented and how some of them have the initial course and um, how important it is to know the difference. Because if you use the initial course, it can um, lead to problems if you have to dead reckon. Um, although that's remote, that's something obviously would be important to know. So, uh, yes, in fact, that is true. Excellent. And uh, Pat, when we crossed the NATS area, we had our route programmed into our EFB, JetView and ForeFlight. So we have two independent sources of information which can be cross-checked. I see nobody mentioning this extra protection procedure. Well, uh, Pat, that's that's good stuff. Um, we did just do three webcasts this year on using an electronic flight bag for plotting and the importance of um, documentation, training, retention of documents and things of that nature. Uh, so um, I hope that in those webcasts, perhaps we would have covered that in more detail um, because it is a very nuanced um, mm -hmm. and complicated method of uh, cross-checking. I love it. Most of us here love it. I absolutely love it. But it doesn't negate the need to do their traditional items in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. And and then there's the FAA statement about the, the EFB being qualified. It has to be connected to the actual uh, official source of position data. So if it's not linked into your... Uh, airing bus, so it gets the the Wi-Fi sends the position data to your EFB, then it's not technically an official source. But so you can still use it sure. and then check your offsite Absolutely. FMS as it would be indicated. And we, we talk about that in training as well. Yes. So it's not a bad tertiary idea, but it's not a t official standalone double check source. In all cases. Good. Joel. Uh, if you have a follow-on session dealing with ETPs, one phenomenon I've noticed is Honeywell FMS calculated ETPs. Uh, Honeywell FMS calculated ETPs differ significantly from our flight planning provider ETPs. <laughs> yes, Joel, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and they've evolved. Uh, they were very primitive in the FMSs initially. And uh they uh, now have the ability in some airplanes, and Joel, you guys are flying some of the newer Honeywells, where you can put in winds, you can put in temperatures and, and true airspeed and things like that. Yeah, um, that'll help it more accurately. There, anytime you compute those using those conditions, it it, it can end up being, and I don't know why. So um, we speak in our training to relying on the documents that you use for planning. Um, I don't know that that won't eventually be replaced by a more dynamic airborne capability, which is more accurate. Um, and we're waiting to, to learn more about that. That's an excellent point, Joel. It is. Very good point. Ed, thank you. Ed's uh, saying also just to note on slop, if you slop in tenths less than one nautical mile, so we're talking 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, then your confirm assigned route report will show deviating right one to eight nautical miles, at least in a G450 slash 550 Honeywell system. That's interesting. Yeah, thank It'll you. will say the full 128 nautical mile. That's that energy limit that we, we picked up right. on the Pacific Oceanic Working Group we were in last. That's interesting. Thank you. Ed. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right. Well, that's, uh, those are all the questions that we have outstanding. Those are excellent questions. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. And we really appreciate the input about the possible topic. And, and Dave, Absolutely. we um, are grateful to you for helping reemphasize these points because Dave sat, Dave Malloy, who was speaking a moment ago, was part of the uh, North Atlantic Scrutiny Group for years and um, several of the other operating groups in the North Atlantic. And his experience in this area um, – is tremendous. It eclipses mine on orders of magnitude. So we really do appreciate that. Absolutely. And thanks to all you that asked the questions, uh, Val, Joel, um, each and every one of you, because the questions are where we learn. Joe and I get the opportunity yes. when you ask questions to rethink what we know 
and then get comments from uh, people out there who are in the field doing this. So um, we appreciate I'll it. End with a thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Val. I appreciate it. Tony, thank you very much.